All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to day one of reInvent. Thank you for taking the time during your lunch hour to come to our session. Um, I'm Isha Dua. I'm a senior solutions architect here at AWS. I've been here four years. Um, I work out of the Bay Area, and I support enterprise customers uh, be success, help them be successful with their AWS deployments and services. Uh, with me today, I'm joined by two gentlemen on the stage. Uh, we have Thomas Michelbach from the Tratton Group, and we have Johannes Fufus from Volvo Cars. Uh, both of them will be talking about how they worked on their software-defined vehicle journeys and how they partnered with AWS, and they'll go into much more detail in the session today. Um, so, so our session um, is cloud-first intelligent code pipelines with Volvo Cars and Tratton. Uh, we are going to share how, you know, how cloud-native sol solutions are actually revolutionizing the way automotive code is uh, it's conceptualized, developed, built, and even tested. Uh, before we go into the agenda, uh, I wanted to share you know, some of these recent surveys that I was reading. So one of them said that by 2030, analysts are predicting that 45% of a car's value uh, or worth will be driven by software, compared to a 5% in 2010. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already know of SOFI here, which is, is industry-led collaboration where they're trying to generate open source solutions and hardware agnostic solutions for the automotive industry. Um, and this is another one, which is the Linux Foundation, where they have a project called Automotive Grade Linux, uh, which is sort of like, an, again, an open source uh, platform for connected cars, and uh, we have, there are over 200 members that are already contributing code to that. So you can see that it's sort of the software-driven approach to uh, building automotive vehicles is no longer, it's no longer a peripheral thought. It's gone from being this peripheral thought to something that we need to think about right now. So uh, today for the session, uh, we're going to be doing exactly that. Uh, we're going to start off with some industry views and trends. We're going to look at what's happening in the automotive industry. Uh, we're going to then follow that up with a sort of introduction, the promise of software-defined vehicles. Uh, we're going to talk about the emergence of software-defined vehicles, what it looks like today, what the future is looking like. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Thomas from the Tratton Group actually talk about how they were un uh, un, they were able to unleash their software-defined vehicles, and they were able to build this vehicle-to-cloud continuum. Um, and then we're going to have Juanes from Volvo Cars, uh, who's, going, who's also going to touch upon how they are sort of shifting left with incorporating the QNX AMI, which is the Amazon machine image, into their pipelines. And then we're going to close that out with a call to action, where we're going to talk about how AWS can help with your journeys if you're on a similar journey, or if you want to learn more, how we can help you succeed. So let's talk about the promise of software-defined vehicles. Um, so the future of automotive is looking very exciting. It's uh, very bright. Um, you know, vehicles are becoming increasingly intelligent. Uh, they are driving themselves. They are parking autonomously. And they're doing a lot of, lot many other tasks with a lot more finesse. Uh, so, you know, it's become this, uh, like the future of cars is now it's looking like a, it, the future is looking such that cars are going to be like any other device. They're going to be any other device that can receive software updates. They can, they can get over the air software updates. Um, data collection is going to become easier in the future. It is still sort of easy, but it's going to continue becoming easier. We're going to have more real time data, more real time telemetry data that's being, that's coming in and we are able to sort of We'll be able to make data-driven decisions. We'll be able to sort of uh, improve the vehicle's performance based on, the, based on what we're seeing in that real-time data. But what it generally offers is um, a better customer experience. Uh, you'd be able to build a more rich and personalized customer experience for your customers. You'd be able to add features, subtract features based on what feedback you're getting. Uh, you may be able to build newer service models, new services for your customers, and overall what we're targeting is that you'll be able to innovate faster. And I think one example that I do share in this space, which I think is awesome, uh, is uh, when a couple of years ago I was reading this article, I think they mentioned that there was this hurricane in Florida. And uh, during the hurricane, Tesla was actually able to issue an over-the-air software update to the drivers in the state. 
and it was able, to, uh, what the update did was it unlocked the full battery potential and provided the vehicle with an additional 40 miles over the typical range of the vehicle. And it helped those drivers get out of the path of the storm. So that's what a software-defined vehicle can do. That's what an over-the-air software-defined vehicle is capable of. So, yes, vehicle code complexity is growing, for sure. Uh, so today's vehicles, there are about hundreds of ECUs. ECUs, I'm sure, um, many of you are aware of the term, electronic control units. These are, uh, these usually have limited computing power, maybe one CPU or one microcontroller unit. Uh, they perform dedicated functions. Uh, when I say dedicated functions, think of like an ECU, maybe this just focusing on the lightning, lighting control, that's focusing on the braking system, that's focusing, focusing on airbags, traction, um, and much more. So they're doing isolated functions with limited computing power. Um, an average vehicle in 2022 had over 100 million lines of code. Compared to an average vehicle back in 2010, it had up to about 10 million lines of code. So this is what today is looking like. But the future is looking like, is, is fully, so where we have a fully software-defined vehicle. What we're likely to see is that the number of ECUs are going to decrease because we're going to, pivot over to architectures with, where we have more high-performing centralized compute in the vehicles. Um, and the lines of code may continue increasing. So, you know, as non-functional requirements increase, as, the, uh, as we have, uh, you know, more autonomous driving coming into the picture, we'll actually see that the software complexity is likely to increase. And as the software complexity increases, we have to start thinking about how we want to re-architect our electric and electronic systems as well. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, traditional architectures or today's architectures, we have hundreds of ECUs, a lot of wiring in the vehicle, they're functionally isolated, um, you know, there's not a lot of connectivity to the cloud or to the edge. So that's what trad traditional architectures are looking like. But what we're pivoting towards are more domain-based architectures or zonal architectures. When I say domain-based, uh, think of, uh, it's basically dividing the components of the vehicle into uh, functionally logical domains. So we'll have a dedicated sort of ADAS domain controller or a powertrain domain controller or an infotainment domain controller. Whereas a zonal architecture divides the components of the vehicles into actual physical zones in the car. So you have the top or the rear or the front. Um, so that's what zonal architectures do. Many OEMs, many automakers that we work with, that we have partnered with, uh, they follow sort of a blend of the both, both of these architectures. And you'll hear more from Thomas uh, about the same later. But, uh, it, uh, so what they do is they divide the vehicle into physical zones, but they also maintain logical separation of business critical functions. Uh, and which architecture you want to pick, it really depends on a variety of factors, but some of them could be, you know, the degree of complexity in the vehicle, how much you're looking to reuse across your various models, or, um, you know, other factors also come into play here. So with that, um, I am going to hand it over to Thomas. Um, and he's going to talk about unleashing uh, software-defined vehicles with Vehicle to Cloud Continuum. Thank you, Thank you. Misha. Um, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of an overview of that journey that we're going Ooh. through. Some of the things are already working. I'll also show a couple of videos to demonstrate that. Uh, but a, a few words about me first. Uh, I've been a part now of uh, trade and R&D um, in the area of EE software and autonomous systems. And I'm since April 2023. I've been with MAN for a little bit longer in my role heading exactly those topics of board platform and connectivity, where the cloud is also included, part of that, indirectly, directly, directly with the vehicle. And I'm passionate about technology, and you'll notice also in, in a couple of examples when I'm going through that. And I'm married, have two kids, and I come originally from Brazil, but have been uh, living 20 years in Germany, and the other colleagues in the pictures are the ones that are working with me exactly in that uh, endeavor in the Trayton Group. Trayton Group is about those four brands that you see, Scania, MAN, Navistar, known also as the international brand, and Volkswagen truck and bus in Brazil. And together we are tackling a difficult situation and challenges um, of the automotive industry, especially in commercial vehicles, and Trayton has a strategy around that in order to focus on specific 
um, challenges where we see that the customer value to all these brands is becoming more challenging. Customers are requiring more and faster. Um, we're seeing that the faster time to market is a reality also towards plug and play technology, especially when a commercial vehicle is being integrated into an ecosystem. We see also the classical problems of the automotive industry with the complexity and the cost uh, of producing vehicles nowadays that's increasing, also with supply chain challenges. And we need to afford all these necessary investments around the today conventional powertrains, but also towards electrification and autonomous systems. And in order to do so, the group Trayton, that is also part of Volkswagen, um, it's now putting that strategy out with a clear way to approach that. And in our area of EE soft and autonomous systems, we are distributed global organization. You see the, the sites and locations in green. We are more than 2,500 people in that organization, spe specifically to that area. And we're trying to create that ecosystem of, uh, uh, of the work model that we deliver the um, different topics on the EE and software development in the specific flows. But you see in the po point three that we have is the so-called trade and EE system architecture. So we have, we'll have a new architecture in place, and I'll show a couple of things around that so that you get a sense what that is. And we have that high ambition that the software transformation will give us uh, new capabilities in order to enter those challenges of the industry, tackling those challenges with software in the future. And that is backed also by a specific agile way of working. Um, but in order to think about what we need to do, we need to understand what is that challenge and what is the vision of the software enablement. And we, we call it the software step change. So basically what we see in the automotive industry is exactly that, that we see there is a fleet that is nowadays connected. You see that in the middle with the, with the different vehicles. And you see on the right of that, that customer needs are being identified very fast and we just explore the solutions very fast and build and deploy on that ecosystem. And that typically over the air, with a very rapid development uh, process on top of it, we need to gather data in order to take decisions and improve uh, the, 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 the deployments to the customer. And we need to, that, to do that in a very automated fashion. And we are climbing that ladder of capabilities that would be the, also the over the air capabilities in that ecosystem. But I think that is state of the art in the, in the automotive company. So in a little bit more detailed and why I'm here. So basically in the ecosystem that I'm, I'm in the offboard platform and connectivity, you see that we have a, 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 a layer in the onboard and connectivity space where we have the so-called connectivity modules. And you see like a little bit of reference of a, an architecture there. So there'll be a, a little bit more details on that. And we have the cloud interconnected to that where we deliver apps, features, data, services, and software updates with a multitude of technologies. So that is our ecosystem where we're delivering that, uh, leveraging a lot AWS, but also the telecom providers, the map providers, and all the, the, the needed functionality for that. We're doing that in an ecosystem where our long haul vehicles, so that you get a feeling what does it mean to have a long haul vehicle, you have like 100 to 150,000 kilometers per year as yearly mileage, a commercial vehicle in a long haul will have mileages in its lifespan more than a million kilometers. And at the moment, we have around uh, the world in the trading group more than one million connected vehicles. And we're moving towards that target architecture and that software step change that we're calling through different layers. And I'll show exactly those layers. So basically going from the vehicle, what happens there, going through the connectivity, then software update, then putting the services on top of it so that we can reach that last layer, reaching the customer and providing the best solutions as we can. In order to do so, we start with a clear, well-defined vehicle architecture. And Isha was already talking about it. We have a centralized functional architecture. It has zone orientation. So basically you see that in the center there is a thing called CVC, the central vehicle computer, where there's the central, centralized logic there. Um, you ha we have also the connectivity module that is then integrated to the cloud. And we have also a specific um, a part that deals with the digital driver workplace as a digital driver unit. And then you have the zones below it, where we have physical characteristics, 
with cab, chassis, etc. And then you have the I.O. modules interconnected. And the upper layer is a high-performance computer layer, also advanced ECU layer. The bottom layer is an I.O. or a classical ECU topology layer. And that modular architecture gives us the possibility to say, okay, we have a layer that is like centralizing logic and another one with extensibility for the specific zones or I.O. And that should be seamlessly integrated with the cloud. And that is the start point of everything that we're doing. And we're introducing parts of that architecture already in January, and we'll move towards iterations in order to improve it. And in the next step, we need to get the vehicles connected. So basically, on top of that vehicle architecture, we have the connectivity capability, being the connectivity module, this, the, the part in the vehicle. But then, as you can see from the left, to the right, you see these vehicles, you see also the big boys, the long haul ones there, um, and they are connected through specific mobile providers worldwide. They enter you know, event-driven architecture via MQTT, uh, an ecosystem where we have services doing pre-processing and post-processing in order to enter then an, a service ecosystem and also the software update ecosystem that I'll show in a minute. We're leveraging a lot of um, uh, elastic container service capabilities with a lot of uh, pre-processing power uh, on that. We're also using very specialized services, also the cloud HS HSM, for example, for specific use cases for security. And we're running that on a multi-account setup because of the different brands and because of the global footprint so that we can decide who is entering where in the infrastructure, why, in which kind of use case. And you see that we're not only on the left part where you see the big boys, the long haul trucks there. Uh, you see also the, the upper part with the vans. We have also vans interconnected with backend connectivity. So connectors that are coming from other providers, for example. We have also integrations between, for example, a main truck and bus and Carriot with the specific van connector from Volkswagen. Uh, we have also web fleet connectors. So it's a, con it's, a, it's a connector architecture in order to enter that ecosystem in order to, 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 to deal with the data coming from the vehicles and then sending back to the vehicles. And after you get those vehicles connected, we say you need to keep those vehicles also up to date because at any point in time, you need to, 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 to think about what does that mean and could something happen that you need an update because of a feature or you need also to run a, a bug fix, for example. And on that uh, use case level of the over the air use cases, we see a clear need also for continuous updates. So basically, at any point in time, we can just push out an update. And you see there on the right, um, the boxes in green, uh, where we enter that word also with a specific admin portal. I will show that in a, in a small video as a demo. Um, and basically, we're just seeing how we can interact with, interact with those vehicles and the fleet of the vehicles. And basically, we need to understand what is on a software repository, also documented, so that we can roll it out. Then out of that, what is possible to be rolled out, we can enter the auto and diagnostic service ecosystem in order to say, okay, I want to interact now with a vehicle to push out something. Uh, and we need to do a couple of other things in order to monitor that and be safe and secure. And then we enter that connectivity module in order to uh, run the updates or the campaign of the update. And there are other use cases for OTA, but that would be one. Um, and basically, when you enter that ecosystem, you will not only do something that is internal for maintaining the fleet up to date, but you see also the other boxes. So it could be use cases that are coming from a workshop, it could be a use case coming from a customer portal, booking a new feature, and that is everything part of that ecosystem. Um, and in order to see that uh, 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 working, I have a couple of examples. So basically, when you want to keep your uh, vehicle up to date, Everything starts with our realm of software development. And here you see an example. It's not different than anything that we just know. Here is an example using GitLab where we have a package that was produced to our connectivity module where <clears throat> we see directly that somebody created the artifact and is a CM4 artifact that is prepared to be rolled out. So this is a pre-production example on a specific release that we are preparing. We are having SOP in the beginning of next year. And basically that package is one of the packages that would go into the connectivity module. And in order to do so, we need also to understand 
that we, we need to get into that over-the-air capability or diagnostic service capability. And basically, you see here a direct demonstration of that capability. So you have the software, and you need now to roll it out. You know, to roll it out, you need to understand where you're rolling it out. So you go to an active connectivity module. You identify it. You see the vehicle that is using it. There are a couple of things that are confidential, so I, I, I blurred it. And then you enter into the distribution of the packages, and you whitelist that specific package that we saw before into that vehicle. And in that specific case, it's a test vehicle that we are preparing for, the, for, 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 for tests, and it needs to get exactly that version. And so basically, we just whitelisted the package that we want to roll out. And in order to proceed, typically, I would not have lost my vehicle. I know the vehicle where it is, but it's interesting to see. So you have visibility, so we have connected vehicles. So I enter the fleet monitor in order to show where is my vehicle. That vehicle is parked just beside my R&D building. Uh, and we just find it and say, okay, this is the location of a vehicle. And basically, we can also see all the data that that connected vehicle is already delivering. So the connecti connectivity module is already working. And on that one, we can push out an over-the-air update. And that's what has been doing constantly so that we can get it up to date in order to do the tests and prepare for the SOP. And you would say, okay, but is that really ready? Is it just demonstration? Yes. So here I will show an example, it's just like a short video to see, it's like um, it's a, a, the test vehicle just caught the information that would be, have features and somebody just turned it on and the features were installed in the background. So you can see that, that the updates were successfully done on that vehicle and it was exactly the one that we were preparing for the case that we are demonstrating the test for the tooth preparing for our SOP, so to get the certification in order to enter the market with that solution. And basically, that's a, a, a demonstration. But if you have the connected vehicle and then you keep it up to date, at the moment, it's like for the customer, yes, it's very nice like a, a smartphone to have it connected and up to date. But really, the added value is to have then the final step towards the custom, customer to have the seamless integration of the so-called digital services to it. And I know it's like uh, it's just an example. So on the on the on the left, uh, we see uh, upcoming service. That's the, the the high level architecture of the upcoming service. So we're doing calculations for routing of battery electric vehicles that are directly using that cloud to vehicle continuum, so that there is interactions between the algorithms calculating routes to the truck that it has to get those updates so that the driver and the fleet manager is constantly updated uh, towards that information is like, how is my reach? How is the route? Where do I get it, my vehicle to be charged? Do I need to react? Do I need to do a retour? Because on a commercial vehicle basis, you need to understand that that big of a mileage that I mentioned, it's, it's directly inherited to the point of cost. Right? So I need to have the vehicle always driving. Right? The TCO in commercial vehicle is very important, and that's why also it's very important to have it always connected so that we get position data, we expect the time of delivery, and other characteristics. And on that note, you see that we're not doing that only from a global perspective at Trayton, but the different brands need also to be able to deliver their own brand-specific services in that ecosystem. And those services can be something that, again, operate on an app, so a driver or a fleet manager, for example, or also in a web interface. But it could be also a connected function in the vehicle. And that example is exactly the one that you will see here with a Scania vehicle. So it's a connected function doing nav navigation information. So it's called connected maps. And the idea is to get up-to-date data to get more reliable calculations and then a horizon to take decisions that is faster and more reliable with that cloud to vehicle continuum. And you see here that the vehicle is driving and as soon as the vehicle gets to a specific sign, it does the sign recognition pretty fast and pretty reliable. And that's based also on that connected function that gives us new possibilities. So and for that one, I was a sh uh, shout out to the teams that are delivering that together between MAN and Scania in order to make it possible. And here we see that the, the, the test vehicle is exactly uh, operating 
near the Scania headquarter in, in, in Sweden, exactly doing those tests of that connected function. So it's not only about the service on the outside, being able to interact with the vehicle, but it's also about the vehicle having a connected function interacting with the outside and enhancing its possibilities. So sometimes we call it even extended uh, vehicle functions because it goes out of the vehicle to get the data needed. And oh. uh, on that note, my conclusion is also towards what Isha already mentioned. Um, what we're doing in order to achieve that and unleashing the power of a software-defined vehicle, software de uh, vehicle is exactly to get those points that were already mentioned. So the idea is to have a better customer experience from the services that are outside of the vehicle, but also the functions that are inside of the vehicle. So for roles or personas like the driver, the fleet manager, the carrier, the shipper, that is a little bit different than a passenger car because of that integration of the, the commercial vehicle in that ecosystem. The vehicles should get better over time. So that, that is very important to have those capabilities that we get it connected and constantly uh, up to date. When we have that, unleashing the power of new services and business models is the key in order to reach the customer and give those new possibilities. But when we have done that, that is like towards the customer, we need to have that data-driven discipline to get also the data out of that uh, uh, learning how the services are, are, are being used, also to improve if there are like problems in the, in the different um, layers that I mentioned, also to improve that on the go, and then do also intelligent decision making. Sometimes it's intelligent decision making for us to do the next best step in the development to improve the product, but also for the customer, so that the customer can get something out on a specific feature or new release that we're going out with. And then continuously increase the performance of what we're doing, right? Sometimes also increasing the performance of a technical thing in the, in the product, but also sometimes increasing the performance of something that the customer needs. For example, improving their TCO, improving their uptime of the vehicle. The vehicle needs to be on the road. And in order to do that, we're leveraging a lot of um, AWS services, not only the typical computational part with EC2, uh, or storage of S3, but we're really leveraging a lot of things towards uh, um, container services. We're leveraging a lot of uh, specialized services allowed, uh, like the security ones that I mentioned, um, a lot of observability because having those connected trucks that are, or buses and vans also, that are delivering data, we need to observe and be able to react on that. And also, if you run a campaign over the air to do an update, you need to be able to react on that if something goes wrong. For example, if a ECU gets an update and it should be rollback, how do you do the rollback? Do you do a bank switch because an HPC has the possibility to just like uh, shift to the last release and then you are up and running again? Those things can go also sideways. So it's important to have all this ecosystem in place in order to, to get the best out of the, the capabilities that we have, not only in the vehicle, but also in the off-board systems um, that I mentioned. And I think on, on, the, on the last message that I have is, uh, and we learned that also as a, as a proverb we're using, um, if you want to be fast, typically you would go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And that means for us at Trayton, together with the different brands that we are, as I said, MAN, Scania, Volkswagen, Truck and Bus, and Navistar with the international one. Um, but also with our partners, with AWS. Because only by sharing that knowledge and also tackling the different uh, uh, challenges that we have in the automotive industry, we're able to do something like that, where I would say Trayton is not that well known, maybe in each brand, but now seeing like what we're doing is about exactly leveraging those capabilities. And on that note, I want to pass the word to Johannes, who would present some capabilities that he is leveraging at Volvo Cars. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Johannes Fufas. I work as a senior principal software engineer at Volvo Cars. Uh, I am the main SUL driver, our CS system we use at R&D. And I also run different initiatives as part of my work. And one of them is uh, the implementation of the BlackBerry QNX AMI. 
that I will talk on that runs on AVS Graviton nodes. Um, I also blog sporadically when I find the time, uh, and I blog for the uh, official Volvo Cars Engineering account in Medium, and I've written a few. One of them, I think, actually ended up a weekend on Reddit on, on the top ones, so you can check that out. And at Volvo Cars R&D, we're using a system called Zool, and it's open source. And that CI system, we mainly run on EKS as a backend, and then we run dynamic EC2 machines, some pods on a cluster also. And um, as part of being a principal software engineer, I also drive two teams, two DevOps teams, uh, and we uh, deploy and host this CI system, Zool, and we also choose which kind of nodes we should deploy for different kind of jobs, and we also um, host a few SDKs, we host a few test frameworks, and other things. And we, Zool is not a big CI system, it's quite small, it comes from OpenStack, and it's now a separate, since a few years, it's a separate project in open infra. And for us, uh, we choose it because of the inbuilt gating capabilities. And I have this picture here on the slide um, describing that. And when, when CI started in the industry, uh, you merge some code and then you run some jobs and you looked at the result. Nowadays, uh, most companies that I know of or cooperate with have um, gating or pre-merged tests. So you publish something as a proposed change, you run some tests, and if those are successful, then you merge. But Zool uh, has something like called future gating, and it's very simple. It's because Zool enables you to have dependencies between repositories. Uh, those can be cross repositories, they can be between different instances, they can be between Garrett instances, between GitLab and GitHub. And uh, that's why we, we choose it, because our current uh, car ecosystem that we work with is, as Isha mentioned, um, more like a data center. So we have these uh, core computer and zones, and we want different teams to be able to depend on each other, and soon we'll keep track of that and take it through its pipelines. And that's why we choose this small and not so known CI system. So, this um, QNX MI that we worked with. Uh, so before we had this, uh, most of our developers run uh, tests, they run unit tests, uh, they compile their things, they use static linters and so forth. And all of this is run on EC2 machines in the cloud. And I think we, uh, when we started with that a few years ago, we peaked at 10,000 jobs each 24 hours for the system. And the system is expanding uh, all the time. Uh, but unfortunately then when we started with a new core computer that we have, uh, we run the QNX operating system. And developers who were used to Linux uh, experienced some differences to, towards that. And the, uh, I mean, we use the AMD architecture, but the actual computer in the car used the ARM architecture. And so we, we, developers, they just threw in software changes all the time, we run that, but then later up, or I mean higher up in the integration chain, we want to test the real binaries, and we do that on, on lab setups, on what we call hardware in the loop rigs, or different kind of systems. And that is, uh, uh, I mean, we experienced a bottleneck here. Uh, so we, we thought like maybe we could run the production intent binaries on the same uh, ARM architecture in Amazon. So we set up a, an external team and we gave them this mission and then we, I as a driver, talk with them every week and, and help them. And, and we contacted BlackBerry and asked, you know, uh, would it be possible uh, for us to, uh, could you help us to run uh, your operating system 
on an ARM-based Graviton node. And I say, you know what? We're working on this, and you can have a pre-release on this. So we, we got that. And with that, we found a lot of more errors that we first discovered on the target hardware. We, we can then found, find these in the cloud. And uh, with this picture you see here, I, I just try to show that basically there is an unlimited capacity. And we can offload these expensive real systems that we can't build infinite amounts of. And of course, we can run the real uh, target binaries that we run in the car. Here is a picture of the web front end of Zool. Uh, and here we see the check gate and the release pipelines. We saw the basic pipelines in Zool. And, oh, and here we have a picture of our core compute in the middle. And we have a lot of high level functionality there. And we have a lot of dependencies towards the different nodes in the car. And, and this is, I explained, the developer can then state that I am depending on this change here, over here, or I'm, I'm, I'm depending on another change. And when you push a change, so will run the check pipelines. And as you see here in the picture, I have a green rectangle. We then boot the Graviton node and run the tests there. And then when uh, reviews are ready or there are enough patches and people are happy, uh, the teams want to release the code or merge it to master. And then we trigger the gate pipeline. And we run the same tests there and a few additional ones. And then when we want to make a release, we just publish a baseline, and we trigger the release pipelines. So uh, the Graviton uh, node we set up uh, consists of two nodes. But first, you can see here in the bottom, uh, the CI system Zool listens to, uh, for instance, a Garrett event. And it will sense that, oh, somebody pushed a patch, patch set and in the relevant repositories. <clears throat> and it will launch a node then based on what project it is, basically. And we have two nodes. Uh, we have to the left here, you can see uh, EC2 Ubuntu node running x86 CPU architecture. And on the right side, we have the ARM-based uh, node where we run uh, a Graviton node where we run the BlackBerry AMI. And on the uh, Ubuntu node, in this case, we have all the mocks needed for the test. Uh, we also have, um, we collect logs, and we also use that actually to uh, take the binaries for the change and inject them or install them on the ARM-based node that doesn't have all the, um, I mean, it has less features than a usual Ubuntu computer. And then we, we, we run the tests, and we collect the logs, and we send those over to the Ubuntu machine. And, uh, yeah, and the logs, of course, are star, uh, stored in uh, S3. And the developer can then look uh, on the logs. And sometimes if they fail, they can go in and check the logs in details. And this produces the same logs as we have if you run the real target computer intended for the car. And the in order for the developer to be able to do debugging if something goes wrong, we have, Zool has a feature called auto hold. So you can just push a change, push a GUI button, say you want to hold it, and then Zool will produce a log, go to where you intended it for stop, it will install all the binaries, it will install the whole complete software stack with your changes added. And then you can SSH into the node and do ordinary debugging. And then when they're happy, they can release a node. And this, this has been a change for us because this is actually enabling cloud-enabled development. Because people, they don't have to run around or try to get a target, you know, a bench node or something and fiddle with that. It can be created automatically. It will have all the latest installations intended for the product and it has the same file structure, and it behaves more or less the same way as the real core ESU would do. Yeah, so some of the benefits of this, being able to run this uh, uh, QNX AMI, is that we actually test the real um, binaries. And in our case, when, when people write unit tests, 
or, or develop the code locally on the computer, they do that on a Linux emulation. And QNX OS, and as we implemented our Linux system, they have different IPC communications. They don't behave the same. And for some parts, that is fine. But for time critical issues where you have a lot of load, you will have a different uh, behavior. And also, not all parts of the stack is the same. So you don't have exactly the same behavior. And also, when it comes to crashing, <clears throat> we have a, um, I think our Linux environments that we have is much more tolerant. So, yeah. So you don't actually have the same behavior of the code uh, that runs on the AMI. And also, uh, the loggings, of course. I mean, the, uh, if something crashes, they get, uh, the developer gets the same logs that they would have if they, they would have a crash on a real target. And because of the similarities that we have between our target central computer in the car and this Graviton node, some teams have also used it for boot sequence analysis. So they are looked at the boot sequence of all the applications and so forth and, and did improvements and optimizations based on this environment. Uh, and then uh, we also use, uh, provide something called CallGrind. It's an open source tool. And CallGrind gives you CPU load distributions uh, in this nice, uh, this is an example from the GUI uh, tool where you get the, all the processes of your application. You can look at their proportion between each other. And this is really useful if you deployed a new advanced feature. You might want to know if you suddenly just consume 50% of your allocated CPU. At the same time, if you update the middleware but you keep the applications the same, it's very nice to see if you have changes in the relative uh, computing resource. So this is really beneficial. Our future Graviton work is that we are, uh, want to integrate more AutoSAR seals, software in the loop uh, systems of more easy use of the car. So we have those available, but we haven't integrated them uh, in tandem with our Graviton nodes. And uh, so by doing this, we wouldn't have to use these mockings that we have today on Ubuntu node. We could actually use the real ECU uh, software from these classic embedded automotive nodes and then let them test as a system instead. Uh, and we also uh, are eager to expand and try QNX 8 when that is available and f future releases of the QNX operating system. Yes, and with that, I hand back to Isha. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, Juanes and Thomas, for the insightful presentation. So, um, you know, we learned a lot during the sessions. We actually, um, we saw how Tratton Group is actually used, uh, you know, building these uh, functional domains and then they're applying that to different contexts and they're able to sort of reduce their develop, uh, de developer and operational costs. They're able to accelerate time to market. Similarly, Volvo is, uh, by integrating the QNX AMI into their pipeline, uh, and building it on Graviton, they were able to sort of uh, identify bugs easier, improve their code quality, reduce dependency on Hill, and many more benefits. And these are the projects that we've been partnering with them on. So AWS has partnered with many other OEMs and automakers on similar projects, and we've gathered some learnings along the way, which we would love to share with you, and we would love to help you with your journeys as well. So I want to shed a little bit more uh, light on where we can help. Uh, so AWS, the first thing that we can do is help you un like conceptualize the idea of cloud-native automotive software, uh, which means that you adopt all sorts of technologies that are focusing on breaking down the monolith. Uh, we, can pro we also have the ability to provide uh, you know, virtual like, ECUs and virtual workbenches so that your software developers are able to execute software without needing a physical target. Um, 
uh, for example, and we, we can also help with the integration piece. So let's say using a bunch of tools and technologies, we are here to help you and your teams and your software developers with integrating those tools and technologies together to build out the pipeline. Um, if you're sourcing them through AWS Marketplace, uh, reach out to your AWS contacts so that they can help you with uh, maybe making the licensing process easier. Um, and so these are areas where AWS can definitely sort of uh, assist you with, uh, as you go through this journey. And uh, some of the other technologies that uh, for the software-defined era that we've been talking about, for the fully software-defined vehicle that uh, all of us have been talking to you about are uh, what you see on the screen here. So you can do a lot with AWS tools and technologies. You can scale to millions of vehicles with, by using our managed IoT services. You can use... Uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can build data lakes, so you can break down data silos by making sure all of your data is actually residing in a data lake environment. Um, you know, and it could be any kind of data. It could be your telemetry data. It could be manufacturing, enterprise, um, ADAS data, all of that residing in this one single place. And because it's all in that one place, it helps you build these downstream pipelines for analytics and machine learning, uh, which are much more mature. You have the ability to do complicated tasks, you know, you can do perception and path planning, you can go into like predictive maintenance, you can do quality control, and you can, and this list keeps going on and on. So data lakes is another area where, uh, which you can leverage to build your analytics and AI ML workloads. Um, in the future, we'll see more connectivity uh, from edge to cloud, you know, with the advent of 5G technologies, there's gonna be more connectivity between the vehicle and the cloud, so that's something that's gonna come up. Um, hardware consolidation and virtualization, which I mentioned previously. So you'd be able to execute your software uh, on phys uh, without actually needing physical targets. You'd be able to virtualize your hardware, your sensors, your networks. Um, and that's going to help bring this parity between the vehicle um, and the cloud. So you'd be able to build uh, in, a more, in, a, in a more agile manner. Um, similarly, you know, uh, you can build these applications. Since you're building in a cloud-native approach, you build these out as microservices. Um, and, you know, these microservices can be deployed in containerized environments, for example, so that you have these easily distributable packages that you can build out. And finally, you can do this using, a, like, a CI-CD mature DevOps pipeline. So you can use the AWS tool suite for the CI-CD pipeline, or you could continue using open source tools and technologies that you currently work with. We saw GitLab, so you can continue working with GitLab and Jenkins and which, whichever tool you prefer. So, um, yeah, so these are some of the areas where we can assist. Uh, definitely um, reach out to either of us if you have any questions after the session. Uh, one of the main exciting things that I forgot to mention earlier, but I, I think it's very important what this fully software-defined vehicle era brings to us, is this ability to sort of decouple hardware and software release cycles. Uh, right now, they're very coupled together. When a vehicle hits the road, you're able to do a couple of bug fixes, but that's pretty much it. But in the future, when you have these you know, independent software cycles and software pipelines, you'd be able to decouple them, and you'd be able to sort of innovate, build faster, you'll have this agile environment that you'll be able to work in. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for taking the time out to attend the session today. Um, hopefully you have a wonderful rest of your week. Uh, and uh, thank you again. <laughs>